Okay, so we are in the 48th uh, episode of the Pain Journal Club and uh, welcome all of you. Today we have a topic which is uh, very, uh, very relevant in the recent times and uh, us being pain physicians, uh, probably we are going to face a lot of lot of questions about uh, this COVID as well. And uh, uh, those of us who are from uh, other backgrounds also will face uh, this uh, situation. So today we are going to discuss uh, post-COVID inflammatory arthritis. And uh, uh, I think uh, it will be uh, very valuable. Before we begin, uh, just a brief about uh, Mumbai Pain School. Uh, so pain medicine world over is uh, having diverse issues and variable standards. Uh, there are different learning requirements and as a result, there are different offerings and uh, money and time are uh, limiting factors which prevent physicians with special interest in pain from uh, understanding and learning uh, and then treating their patients. So to overcome this uh, uh, issue, uh, Panacea Spine Wellness Pain Relief Center Mumbai has come up with Mumbai Pain School, uh, which is uh, uh, promoting uh, pain education through various social media. Uh, our popularity is a sign of uh, the interest which uh, the physicians have in this topic that is pain. And uh, we are using trying to use different platforms uh, to propagate this information. Uh, most of our content is online uh, and on demand. Uh, most of it, it is free and uh, we also have paid content. Uh, we also conduct uh, hands-on workshops. Uh, recently, the last one was in December. Uh, we are very fortunate to have expert faculties from all over the world. And it is said that the best teachers, they teach from the heart and not from the book. What is a journal club? It's nothing, just a club. The only difference is that we critically evaluate recent academic literature here, which is based on a defined subject and we value attendee participation. So guys, uh, just uh, be free to ask your questions, comments, suggestions, everything is welcome. This is the uh, venue for the first documented journal club, popularly known as the Bart's Hospital. It's also, at that time it was Bartholomew's Hospital. Uh, and Sir James Paget started his first one. Across the Atlantic, the cost of the journals was what prompted Sir William Osler to start his journal club uh, in uh, 1875. Uh, even Harrison had his own journal club and he used to conduct it at one point of time, he used to conduct it uh, twice a month. Critical evaluation was his uh, area of interest. And uh, as we know that time is discipline, so I request uh, the speakers today, we have me and Dr. Jeshnu uh, to stick to timelines and healthy skepticism or praise is uh, most welcome guys so please feel free to type in the chat box or comment section this is a bit about me uh, the most important thing is that i am from mumbai and i practice uh, full-time pain medicine and uh, i'm working as a spine and pain physician so uh, now let me uh, take you all to uh, the uh, introduction and I'm going to give you the introduction on post-COVID inflammatory arthritis and this is going to be a sit talk and I'll try to finish in eight minutes. So why is this important for pain physicians? It is extremely important so much so that is that even a question? So remember when I started I'll tell you uh, you know most of the physicians when they start uh, they will advertise themselves as pain physicians. The first patients which they will get is often the ones which are not requiring you. So maybe your uh, tummy ache patient will come to you. He'll say that, okay, I'm having this pain in my abdomen now. Can you help me? Then we ask, okay, how long? Oh, three days. So you'll get all sort of patients. And when you popularize yourself as a pain physician, then probably they're going to ask you, what, what is this pain related to COVID? Because it's the hot topic now. So definitely some patients will definitely come to you uh, with, with these symptoms. So that's not even uh, a relevant question. Now, today I'm going to explain to you uh, the most important concept behind uh, this uh, uh, arthritis, which is known as molecular mimicry. So mimicry, we all know, 
uh, what is mimicry so you just kind of ape or copy the others as in the picture you can see uh, that the um, younger sister is copying uh, the elder one or vice versa uh, just type in the chat box what do you think who is copying who uh, the younger one or the elder one who is the copycat so it is the same uh, thing which happens in uh, uh, in the human body and uh, this triggers a humoral and cellular auto reactivity in the host host is human at the end of the process by which the epitope epitope is a portion of the uh, it's it's a portion which is presented uh, to the antigen uh, producing cells it cross reacts between the viral agent and the host so uh, this is nothing but it is an auto reactivity okay the same thing like this girl is copying the other one uh, so one of the girls is copying the other one so here uh, the sars cov uh, two protein they demonstrate one minimum match to human protein in a peptidome comparison covering 37 viral proteins so you already know that the uh, this virus that is this coronavirus has a uh, already got a matching sequence protein and this particular protein is thought to induce this auto reactivity so thus these stated similarities may lead to intolerance of body's own peptides uh, that is these uh, epitopes and in induce various autoimmune uh, disorders and uh, clinical arthritis so this is uh, you know uh, supposed to be the uh, pathogenesis uh, so now if you see uh, guys just let me mute everyone <laughs> Okay. Okay. So now, if you see, there is a potential relationship between different viral agents encompassing the Epstein Barr virus. This is this in this terms, uh, this virus is not unique. So you have the uh, hepatitis C virus, cytomegalovirus, virus, parvovirus, even some bacteria, and and they can activate the autoimmunity. And uh, if you see, this SARS-CoV-2 stimulates interleukin six related pathways, and induces a cytokine storm and macrophage activation syndrome by this mechanism this is already known uh, so it can influence the antigen presentation as well as differentiate uh, interferon dependent pathways so uh, this picture you'll see at least three times today uh, so this is just the trailer now let's go to what is reactive arthritis now why i'm covering this is because from all the literature which is available till date it appears that uh, post covid arthritis inflammatory arthritis is nothing but it is a form of the reactive arthritis okay so uh, if you see it is an arthritis which mostly this reactive arthritis is a mostly uh, occurs after genitourinary or enteric infection and uh, it occurs between the age of 18 and 40 years and mostly uh, affects males clinical natures of arthritis induced by infection of a tissue distant to the joint uh, rather than an infection affecting primary so the basic nature of this arthritis is that it is induced by infection of a tissue which is distant to the joint rather than uh, affecting the primary joint structures and it is thought to be a result of a complex process which passes between the triggering environmental factors and which uh, then it is transmitted to the joint so you can see this is gut mucosa and uh, this is the joint so what all happens in between uh, that is the pathogenesis which i will explain to you in a moment so important point here is that oligoarthritis predominate means you have multiple joint involvements which is most commonly seen in reactive it can have be monoarthritic also but most commonly they are multiple now let's come to this picture which i have already shown you twice so the importance of this picture is that if you see these antigen presenting cells they are the ones uh, they, they can be macrophages or other cells uh, and they pick up these antigens which are nothing but small portions of peptides which then are taken uh, to the inside of the cell uh, and uh, where this response happens so they induce uh, misfolding so it is accentuated by the hla b27 and uh, uh, this uh, induces uh, the uh, specific proteins which are then uh, read by the uh, the cells which are having a role in the immunity which are shown in this picture okay 
once it is presented and internalized and uh, uh, it starts disseminating so this this is the mucosal response so all this is happening in inside the lymph node in the mesentery that is the mesenteric lymph node okay so all this is still in the lymph node then it goes to the uh, to the uh, through the blood stream or through the uh, lymphatic drainage uh, and becomes generalized and it can then go to the joints and there uh, these uh, il it can lead to production of il17 interferon gamma and then as a result uh, you know uh, trigger the cascade of uh, inflammation okay so uh, this is the pathophysiology of reactive reactive arthritis in short now let's discuss the clinical features of uh, the covid uh, the uh, arthritis occurring after covid here it is generally appeared after acute infection and during the recovery period median is 18 days so maybe some patients got in 9 days some patient got in 40 days so like that and it usually occurs in males after 50 this is a contrast from the reactive arthritis in reactive arthritis it was occurring in 18 to 40 okay but now in covid post covid it is reported in after 50 okay now another contrast is that monoarthritis was the most common form of involvement uh, in uh, this arthritis cases after COVID-19. So that is post-COVID arthritis has most commonly monoarthritis. So you will get the patient with uh, pain in only one joint and which is the most common joint, which is the knee joint, which is being affected. Okay. And also you can have oligo and polyarthritis at equal rates. Now, HLA B27 positivity is not necessary for developing uh, reactive arthritis, but it has a potentiating effect. So, those of your patients who are presenting with post COVID arthritis with HLA B27 positivity, so this, this can be, uh, uh, you know, having a potentiating effect. Okay. Now, there are some confounding factors uh, that is in uh, which may be responsible for differences uh, between the reactive arthritis and the uh, uh, COVID arthritis, post COVID arthritis. Uh, so these include uh, the fact that HCQ and steroid is used quite early in COVID. Okay. And even if you see historically in the first wave also HCQ was quite commonly used. So this will reduce the incidence of uh, reactive arthritis. Second is there can be low reporting. Uh, then the third is young COVID patients are relatively asymptomatic. So as a result, uh, they, and they get quicker, uh, the better also faster. So as a result, probably uh, this can be one of the confounding factors in the differences. Now, what is the treatment? Treatment is, uh, uh, these uh, all the cases have shown complete and rapid response to the non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, glucocorticoids or a combination. So you treat it as a flare-up of the arthritis. Okay. So what happens if the duration of COVID increases? So once the duration of the COVID increases, I could find this particular case, which has reported sacroiliitis. Uh, and this is uh, they, this patient particular had uh, almost uh, an year of, uh, uh, you know, the infection and uh, they had got longer than usual course. So naturally, if the virus is living for longer in your body cells and it's not shed and removed out of the system, then there are more chances of these autoimmune issues, uh, you know, happening. So we learn from this that the duration may have implications. Okay. So to conclude, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. Reactive arthritis just got a baby. So it's just one of the, uh, you know, forms. Uh, it seems uh, likewise. The treatment is early symptomatic. And uh, of course, in this era of long COVID, it's an area of research and uh, also great interest. It's interesting to see if people who had multiple COVID infections whether they develop uh, this arthritis or not. So this is it from my end. Now I will uh, pass on the baton to uh, Dr. Jeshnu, who I think is ready. Welcome, Dr. Jeshnu. You can put up your CV slide. And I will introduce you. Great. OK. I think it's visible, sir. Yes, it's visible. Just move on to the CV slide. I will introduce you and then you can start. So Dr. Jeshnu Tople is done his DA, DNB, FIPM, FIAPM, and also the ECPM uh, from the European Pain Federation. He is an assistant professor in charge of pain clinic, Department of Anesthesiology, JNMC Vardha. 
he is a visiting faculty at uh, daradia pain hospital in kolkata he is also a consultant at mitigate pain clinic in nagpur he is a uh, invited faculty for pain conferences cmes and workshop so welcome dr jishnu over to you thank you sir <clears throat> so lot of things have already been covered by you so not much has to be uh, is to be told in this presentation but uh, what i am presenting here is a paper uh, titled as post covid 19 arthritis it's a, a case report and literature review as title suggests it is a case report and literature review was published in Clim clinical rheumatology on 15th of feb 2021 and it was authored by various authors from university of powda italy so to start with we all know that researchers from all over the world are studying the pathogenicity mechanism of uh, sars cov2 respiratory infection and primarily it is immune mediated consequences which lead to uh, which are uh, caused by trigger uh, by trigger of the virus and in most severe cases we have see, we have already seen that patient can land up into pro coagulant states and inflammatory cytokine storms that is uh, which is quite similar to macrophage activation syndromes and this dysregulated hyperimmune response can elicit the autoimmune process and in the predisposed individuals we all know everything whatever we have seen till now this viral infection has been involved in the pathogenesis uh, of uh, rheumatological conditions we know that lot of viruses like uh, gut infection and urinary infections have been associated with rheumatological conditions so coming to the case report the authors was encountered with uh, were encountered with 60 year old caucasian male with uh, no relevant comorbidity uh, comorbidities who was hospitalized hospitalized in emergency room for the uh, complaints of hyperpyrexia headache asthenia and worsening of dyspnea this happened in april 2020 in emergency room only the thoracic ultrasound and chest x ray was done which was suggestive of interstitial pneumonia and obviously at that time the thought was going for sars cov 2 and nasopharyngeal swab was taken and it was found to be positive for sars cov 2 later on blood test were done which were suggestive of uh, severe inflammatory uh, process going on, on and then patient was admitted to internal medicine and treated with azithromycin ceftriaxone hcq and anticoagulants and low flow oxygen was required at that time but uh, after that the, there was progressive respiratory failure and patient needed to be uh, shifted to icu where the nasotracheal intubation was done and patient was put on ventilator and uh, in icu patient was put on broad spectrum antibiotics like meropenem and linezolid also there were anti uh, he was administered with antimycotic prophylaxis diuretic infection noradrenaline for hemodynamic support and anticoagulants for the elevation of didyma values uh, after this rigorous treatment there was progressive improvement for respiratory gas exchange and chest x ray and after that about after 10 days patient was extubated and then was discharged in good general condition however there was low grade inflammation on blood test Uh, this was done overall after 19 days of hospitalization and then there was weekly surveillance for nasopharyngeal swab for uh, sars cov 2 which was repeatedly negative then about 13 days after the discharge patient started complaining of right ankle pain right knee pain and right hip pain and this was also associated with low grade fever so with this complaint patient again uh, presented in the emergency room there with oligoarthritis of right lower limb and patient uh, blood investigation was done where the crp level was found to be quite high so on physical examination and ultrasound examination he was been labeled as uh, uh, he was it was been found that there was slight right ankle inflammation and there was clear cut right knee joint arthritis so for right knee joint arthritis arthrosynthesis was done where the 20 ml of fluid was uh, extracted which was cloudy yellow and it was uh, after analysis it was suggested to be highly inflammatory synovial fluid sino again synovial rt pcr for sars cov 2 and synovial fluid culture for bacterial agents was done and it was found to be negative there was no suggestive uh, there was no history of uh, I'm so sorry. 
there was no history of any infect, infectious symptoms, recent history of trauma, dyspnea, previous episodes of arthritis or ductilitis, conjunctivitis, uveitis, or um, inflammatory diarrhea. And there was no personal or family history of psoriasis. So patient was, uh, uh, detail, detail history was taken from the patient. After that, patient was hospitalized for further investigation and extensive investigations were done. Again, nasopharyngeal swabs were done and uh, it was found to be negative. However, on investigation, patient has been found to be serologically suggestive of seroconversion. There was seroconversion. But other investigation like urine culture, blood culture, stool culture, and procalcitonin levels were all within normal limits. Then ANA, anti-nuclear anti antibodies, rheumatoid factor, ACC, ACCP, and all uh, HLA-B20, everything was found to be negative. However, only positive finding were that on X-rays there of the ankle, hip, and uh, knee, there were erosion and intra uh, intraarticular calcification was found. So even after extensive investigation, authors could give, uh, get that patient was uh, serologically suggestive of uh, there was seroconversion and x-rays were indicating towards the erosion and intraarticular calcification. Sinovel fluid was also suggestive of markedly inflammatory and infrequent findings in infectious uh, related arthritis have been previously seen. That there is a temporal relation of SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, made the hypothesis that post-viral uh, acute infection, post-viral acute arthritis is the most probable cause. And that's why a patient was put on NSAID, that is ibuprofen 600 mg twice a day. And it has been found to be benefiting the patient clinically and there was decrease in CRP levels as well. So this was continued and then patient was discharged after about nine days. However, the NSAIDs were continued for next three weeks. And there was further follow-up was taken and uh, up to about six months after the discontinuation of the therapy. And still the patient was uh, presented with no signs of arthritis recurrence. So coming to the next part of presentation, that is discussion and a review of literature. We, have, we know that viruses have been associated with uh, arthritis. However, pathogenesis is still not very well understood. And I'm not going to talk much about this uh, molecular mimicry and all those things because Dr. Siddharth has extensively been cover, covered that thing. But still, I'll just go through it. That molecular mimicry is supposed to mediate the activation of inflammatory process. This leads to autoimmune response and predisposes to uh, predis uh, in predisposed individuals. This molecular mimicry concerning SARS-CoV-2 are also been reported in literature. How this mechanism is hypothetically involved in the pathogenesis of both acute systemic infection and as well as post-infective viral related immunological consequences. So coronaviruses share molecular epitome with human proteins. And this is considered to play a key role in host invasion and escaping the immune response attacks, thereby giving this infectious agent an immune evasive capacity. So SARS-CoV-2 shares three sequences of six amino acids in brainstem in human protein. This has been proved till now, and that's why there can, there, it can lead to brain damage and respiratory failure. Mimicking epitomes may also be present in synovial membrane, but this is, is not well proven till now. And this can lead to acute local inflammation. So for this uh, uh, post-COVID arthritis, patient had done extensive research on PubMed uh, and searched for the uh, literature from January 2020 to October 2020 with the keywords that with uh, acute, acute arthritis, reactive arthritis, viral arthritis, COVID-19, coronavirus, and SARS-CoV-2. Only literature which was written in English with the case reports of adult patient were included. So, um, authors found overall 13 articles of which seven were excluded and only six were included. So exclusion, uh, exclusion was done depending on various uh, causes like one was only corresponding letter and was not included any case report. Two were related to gouty arthritis and not strictly related to COVID-19 arthritis four were not per pertaining to the purpose of review. So after all these things, only six articles were included. These are the six articles which you can see where uh, in the 
first case report it was a 57 year old man who developed arthritis 15 days after the COVID-19 diagnosis in the right knee. And with this patient recovered without any treatment. Another case was found where 47 year old male was diagnosed uh, with the COVID, uh, was diagnosed with arthritis at the time of diagnosis of COVID-19. In wherein right knee was affected and he was put on oral NSAID as well as intraarticular corticosteroids and then patient recovered. Another patient was a male in his 50 who developed arthritis after about 21 days of COVID-19 diagnosis in ankle uh, bilaterally, who was put on NSAIDs and intraarticular corticosteroids, and then he recovered. Uh, I'm so sorry. All good. Yeah, uh, then actually, I can see your screen. Okay, okay. No problem. Uh, then there was another. Uh, you can make it full screen. Now it's uh, reduced. Okay, uh, just a minute. I think some technical issue is there. I'll, I'll do no, it. No problem. Uh, then there was a, another 73 year old man who developed arthritis 15 days after the infection. But this was an interesting case where patient developed it in upper limb uh, involving the small joints and he was put on oral NSAIDs only. Then there was a 37-year-old female. So if you have listened to Dr. Siddha's presentation carefully, this is some exceptional case where female as uh, if, if patient gender was female and she was younger. She developed uh, arthritis after about 12 days of uh, COVID infection uh, and wherein there was tendinitis, uh, tendinitis of right hand. So here again, upper limb was involved and patient was put on oral opioids, NSAIDs, topical NSAIDs and gabapentin. Again, there was another 58-year-old female who developed uh, arthritis after 25 days in ankle and who was treated with oral NSAIDs. Another patient was there with 60-year-old man who developed uh, arthritis after 32 days of the COVID uh, in the right knee and right ankle was again put on oral NSAIDs. But overall, if you look at overall, if you look at the battery of investigations done in this patient, only only few of the authors have done extensive uh, workup, but rest have done only like partial workup. So coming to the next part, the Synovial fluid analysis was not performed in three cases, which may not be able to rule out the mi microcrystal etiology and uh, rest of the cases, crystals were not detected. So wherein the crystal arthropathy was excluded. The lag time between SARS-CoV-2 infection and onset of arthritis have been, is variable, but the joint symptoms generally present days after the acute viral infection and usually during the healing period. The prominent involvement was uh, for the lower joints with mono or oligoarthritis symptoms, and there was a, a predilection for male gender. The clinical presentation that emerges from these case reports may deviate from the classic picture of viral related arthritis where joint involvement usually occurs during the viremia period and presents with the polyarticular patterns, sometimes resembling rheumatoid arthritis. Continuing our discussion, we know that there is low prevalence of arthritis uh, in a COVID-19 patient might be attributed because this patient have been very well treated, uh, like corticosteroids and HCQ, uh, HCQ have been incorporated in the treatment of COVID-19 infection only. So this might have prevented or weakened the inflammation of uh, joint involvement and thereby there might be low prevalence of arthritis in COVID-19. Viral related arthritis is primarily a diagnosis of exclusion and that's why we need extensive diagnostic workup. However, most often the diagnostic workup is often partial and incomplete. In this case report, authors have extensively investigated uh, the patient and, did, uh, and it did not show the presence of virus in synovial fluid and this validates the hypothesis of immune mediated process. All the cases of suspected post COVID-19 arthritis gave prompt response to NSAIDs and corticosteroids. This again suggestive of strict relation of SARS-CoV-2 infection. 
molecular mimicry based pathogenesis is antibody response to the virus is crucial to induce joint inflammation this hypothesis could also explain why arthritis have been reported only in patient with severe infection in mild and forms of covid-19 it is proposed that joint involvement might be there but it is in subclinical and therefore it is less frequently uh, encountered by medicals so limitation accepted by the authors is are none but on critical analysis uh, we can uh, easily find out that the data is not sufficient to conclude about gender predilection there are case reports which suggest that the uh, the case reports were in male patients have been more uh, frequently encountered but however this small data is not sufficient enough to say that uh, male gender is more prone for covid-19 related arthritis then this is a single case report and we all know that it is uh, case reports are the one of the weakest evidence we can have in literature that's why we need more studies to understand the pathogenesis and there was no detailed discussion in this case report about the overall management or preventive strategies which can be applied for uh, covid-19 arthritis covid-19 related arthritis yeah, we uh, it has been discussed that nsaids and corticosteroids are uh, helping to get rid of uh, this arthritis but the mechanism for this and for how long uh, nsaids can be administered and these patients are primarily uh, if we have we have seen that are usually or geriatric uh, in geriatric age group and how long we can prescribe the nsaids to this compromised patient is again a questionable thing so this was not very well covered in this article so con coming to the concluding slide we all know this is new entity still under study and cases for covid-19 arthritis are growing that's why complete clinical and laboratory data sinovial fluid anal analysis and strict follow up of the patient are of paramount importance thank you thank you uh, dr jeshnu that was uh, uh, great uh, so uh, let's move on to the questions now and have some discussion so i think we have one question from dr samir and uh, i think dr jeshnu you can answer this because it was very well covered in your this thing diagnostic workup so what all is covered in the diagnostic workup that is his question yeah see dr samir uh, it, viral arthritis have been historically is a diagnosis of exclusion it is never that viral arthritis another name for this we call it reactive arthritis the dr siddharth has covered but reactive arthritis or viral arthritis is diagnosis of exclusion so we need to rule out all the causes of arthritis which uh, which can lead to the clinical presentation which may include that there can be subclinical infection so that's why uh, fluid analysis is very well required it can be secondary to systemic inf uh, infection like uh, gut infection or urinary infection or it can be a presentation secondary to any other rheumatological disease or vascul vasculitis kind of th thing so we need to extensively rule out those things as well also uh, many of the times uh, patient uh, we we may miss that uh, we, may, we may not send synovial fluid we may not go for arthrocentesis and send synovial fluid for, to rule out crystal arthropathies and sometimes even those small crystal crystals can lead, not not the only gouty arthritis but other non gouty arthritis crystal arthropathy can also be a very well cause for this monoarticular or polyarticular arthritis so we need to rule out all those things and that's where the extensive diagno uh, extensive workup um, mean i hope i am clear yeah i think I covered everything so now let's move on to the next question uh, which is from dr uh, kritika she is asking amongst nsaids hcqs and steroid which is preferred or a combination doses and how long so this is not different from dr kritika this is not very different from the usual flare ups of the arthritis which you are treating regularly and uh, uh, you know the preferred agent is of course an nsaid if uh, there is no contraindication and for as short as possible uh, and of course if you are your patient is predisposed to gi 
complications or if they have a uh, cardiovascular uh, risk factors then you can modify the uh, prescription uh, so now for how long so the length depends on the uh, severity of the symptoms and uh, uh, typically they will uh, uh, settle very fast maybe on the third or fourth day uh, you can have good response if you have started with a good dose don't start with a micro dose like micro doses uh, for example if you want to give um, uh, say uh, celecoxy we want to give so if you are giving in uh, 100 uh, mg in the evening and then expecting that okay at night he will not have inflammation morning you are not giving okay thoda uh, you are uh, trying that okay i'll give a little less dose that won't work because uh, the patient will not have relief and then uh, the whole cycle will uh, keep on continuing so use the correct dose and uh, uh, so in that case you can start uh, with at least 100 mg twice a day and uh, similarly uh, with the other medication also use the correct dose which is indicated below that you know you are not going to uh, cause any good to the patient so i think uh, please allow me to come here sir but the idea behind administering NSAID for such patient is not just to relieve the pain see just to relieve the pain we can also administer like um, Opioid. Yeah. Oh, yes, mild opioids. But the idea behind administering NSAIDs here is to reduce the inflammation. Yes. And if you are giving suboptimal doses of NSAID, there won't be reduction of inflammation. If you are not treating the inflammation, th there will obviously be ongoing arthritis, that is pain and destruction of the tissue will be ongoing. You need to control that infection part, uh, sorry, inflammation part. So you need to administer NSAIDs in adequate doses only and for adequate length of time. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jeshnu, for pitching in and emphasizing that point. Now let's move to uh, Dr. Varsha's question. Uh, is there any role of neuromodulators? Probably she means to ask uh, gabapentinoids and other drugs. So I don't think there is any role of, uh, because it's a very acute phase. So I, I, I don't think there is any role for that. What do you say, Dr. Jeshnu? Yeah, same here, sir. Like, uh, see, gabapentinoids or... Uh, what you say and um, antidepressant play their role in chronic pain only this is acute pain if patient is having like predisposing uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis or spa or uh, any other thing in that case you can administer these uh, tcas and all those things but however in acute cases um, there won't be any much role however there is one case in this uh, review that they have used gabapentinoid but I don't find any rational behind it. Yeah, so this is a question from Dr. Samir. In your practice, is there any experience where the NSAIDs was ineffective and there was a requirement of oral or systemic steroids? Yes, many times. Uh, you know, this uh, nowadays you know very well that NSAIDs are uh, taken left, right and center by, you know, the patients themselves. Uh, and uh, although some patients uh, are, are, you know, resisting, but um, some patients are taking also. So these patients, you should ask the good history of whether they have taken the NSAID and which NSAID they have taken. Say, for example, somebody has taken a very potent NSAID already, uh, and then you are going to give another NSAID, it's not going to give him relief. So there can be uh, uh, an administration of uh, oral uh, um, uh, steroid in these uh, situations so yes definitely yes okay so if there are no more questions uh, then we move to the last part i will just like to thank uh, dr jeshnu again and uh, for his uh, good presentation and uh, for his uh, great discussion points as well so thank you dr jeshnu and uh, thank you sir uh, now we move on to the next step. So the secret of getting things done is to act. So guys, uh, just try and join our mailing list. The link I have already provided. Uh, we also have a WhatsApp group. Just join that. Uh, suggestions, comments are most welcome. If you want any particular topics to be covered, please put in the chat box right now. Uh, in future, we may take up those topics or at least I can send you the old links to the old cl journal clubs, which we have already done on the same topics. 
suggestions and comments are welcome just mail me on mumbai paint school at gmail.com uh, and of course uh, please keep learning uh, 2022 is uh, no different and try to make learning a habit join us uh, on most fridays we are available and uh, uh, looking forward uh, to seeing you all uh, very very uh, soon again uh, next uh, friday also we have a very exciting uh, uh, thing coming up so guys please join in uh, with the uh, with the next friday as well and uh, looking forward to seeing you all very soon uh, bye bye